this to light because of the revelation God has given him. It is no more a secret thing. But instead tonight, it belongs to those to whom it's been revealed. And that's you and I tonight. If you're saved, you're part of the body of Christ tonight. You are the church of the living God. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1 just for a moment. And look, if you will, at verse number 23. Paul is talking here. And verse 22, the latter part. He writes that Christ is the head of the church, which is His body. And so tonight, we are members of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, having been born by His Spirit, washed in His blood, and filled with His holy presence, uh, the Holy Spirit of God. We are part of the eternal or the invisible body of Christ, but we are also the visible body that is assembled here in this place tonight. And so this mystery is going to be called the church, which is His body, and it's comprised both of the Jew and of the Gentile as one in Christ Jesus Himself. The creation of God was His showpiece and his, of His eternal power and of His Godhead. But can I submit to you tonight that the church would be His crowning masterpiece. Uh, you think about that tonight. The uh, people from all walks of life and all phases of life who uh, uh, was dead in their trespasses and in their sins uh, and were disobedient children have been called by Him, uh, called out from this world uh, and has been redeemed by the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ and have been made whole and pure in the sight of God. Brother Reg alluded to it tonight sometime we don't always feel clean or feel pure but my friends when God sets you free you're free from sin indeed and you're no longer a servant unto it uh, but you are the sons and the daughters of the living God and so you're a masterpiece as far as God is concerned uh, Paul would show us three things tonight that I want to try to share with you real quickly and then I'll uh, move out of the way uh, for the next service. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice in ch chapter 3 verses 1 through 9 is the enlightenment that, that God has given Paul to give to you and I that we can look at this and understand what he's talking about. The word enlightenment is to be informed or it's to be clarified or taught or instructed in what this church is going to become uh, while it's here upon the earth. And I want you to notice in chapter 3, verse number 1, as well as chapter 4, verse number 1, Paul declares that he is the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not the prisoner of Rome. Uh, he's in chains and shackles because uh, that he is revealing this mystery of the church uh, and preaching Christ to a world that's lost and undone. And therefore, he's become the prisoner of Christ. And he doesn't feel uh, at all ashamed uh, that he's in bonds and in stock that he can declare such a message uh, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Uh, and so he is the prisoner of this truth, of this mystery. He's also a pioneer pioneer of this truth. And the truth of this mystery was given to Paul according to verse number 3 by revelation. If you recall there was a passage of scripture, I believe it was over in the letter to the Galatian Christians, where Paul said this gospel which I preach uh, was not taught to me by man neither received I it by man but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I want to submit to you tonight uh, that what's wrong in this uh, hour that we live tonight uh, is that we're more dependent upon uh, uh, the educational system to try to give us the preaching. Uh, and we need to just get back to the uh, to the Word of God uh, and humble ourselves uh, and let the Holy Ghost of God teach us what this book says uh, and put some fire in our souls. Uh, I told a young boy that was going to go off to school, I said, son, go get all the learning and education you can, uh, but make sure you've got you a silent place, a secret place where you get along with God and you talk to Him about His Word. Uh, and and you pray that He puts some power and some fire in your soul that when you stand up and preach, uh, they may not think you're learned or you're educated, uh, but they'll be better served if they see the power of God than they will if they see the illiteracy of your education. Amen. That's right. That's important tonight that we understand that we need this power from heaven to declare this message. God gave Paul the revelation of what the church would be. It would be born again believers, blood washed, blood bought, Holy Ghost filled, connected to His body all across this world. It is amazing tonight the amount of things that has happened in the church and all of the doctrines that have come in to separate us. Can I tell you tonight, there are a lot of things that we may differ on throughout this world, 
there's one thing you cannot be wrong about. If Jesus Christ is not your Savior, if He's not the Son of God in your life, uh, then, my friend, heaven's not your home. Because there's one way, one truth, and one life. Uh, and there's no other word, a uh, way, except uh, that it be through the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said that he had preached or had written about this aforetime. Uh, and he said, when you read it, that you may understand. So I want you to turn back for just a moment to the book of Romans chapter 11. And let's look at what Paul wrote aforetime uh, so that we can understand a little bit of this mystery. Now in chapter 11, here's what Paul is dealing with. Uh, in chapter 11, he is talking about Israel, who was the natural branch of the olive tree. And uh, Paul is talking about the goodness of God on them which received His goodness, and the severity of God upon them which fell. And those who fell was those Jews who would not believe Him, uh, who would not acknowledge that He was the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You remember John the Apostle wrote and said, Jesus came unto His own, and His own received Him not, but as many as did receive him to them. He gave the power to become the sons of God. Uh, it requires tonight that we believe Him and that we have faith in Him. Uh, he that comes to God must believe He is God and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Uh, and you don't have to have a lot of knowledge about how to pray uh, or what you ought to pray. Uh, if God is drawing you and God is calling you, uh, Jesus said, No man can come unto me except it's given unto him of my Father. Uh, and Jesus has promised us tonight that all that the Father gives him shall come to him uh, and, and he that comes to him shall in no wise be turned away. So tonight the good news is simply this. Uh, you haven't committed a sin he can't forgive and you haven't gotten so far out of the reach of God that he can't reach you. Uh, his hand is not short that he cannot save and neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Uh, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord the Bible says they shall be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the glory of God. Now in Romans chapter 11, in verse number 25, Paul talked about some branches that were cut off. And then he talked about the Gentiles. And that's who we are tonight. We are Gentiles. And I want you to listen now to something Paul said. He said we were the wild olive tree, but we were grafted in to the natural tree. If God can graft us in, then on them, the severity that, that God fell upon them that uh, were cut off, God is able to graft them in again. Now don't misunderstand me tonight. I don't believe in Reformed theology. I don't believe that the church has replaced Israel. God's apple of His eye is still the nation of Israel. But thank God Almighty tonight that He also has separated a people unto Himself called the church. And in this hour that we're living tonight, we are that group of folks. And we're the Gentiles tonight. And we've been grafted into this wild olive tree contrary to nature. And, and Paul comes on down uh, in this chapter to verse number 24 and says, If thou were cut out of the olive tree, which was wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Uh, the salvation of God has come to you and I tonight uh, uh, because uh, God has allowed you and I to become part of this great thing called uh, the church of the living God. Uh, look at verse 25. Paul said, I would not that you should be ignorant, brethren, uh, of this mystery. He's referring back now to this mystery that I'm preaching about tonight on God's crowning glory of the church, which is that mystery. He said, you should not be ignorant of this. That means unlearned about it uh, or become wise in your own deceit. Uh, Conceits, but rather he says, blindness is uh, happened unto Israel in part until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Uh, oh, thank God tonight that there was a door opened unto us, uh, and Jesus Christ was that door uh, that was open to us. Uh, in fact, if you read chapter two, Paul reminds them that uh, the, the Jews were called the circumcision, uh, and us uh, Gentiles were called the uncircumcision, uh, and the circumcision remind us uncircumcision decided uh, that there was a time in this world that we was without a covenant. We were aliens. We had no promise. We had we were without God in the world. Uh, we were then that was afar off and kept separated because of the middle wall of partition uh, that separated between us and the Lord. Uh, uh, but, but the Bible says now 
God in Christ has taken down that middle wall of partition uh, and there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, uh, but we are all one in Christ uh, and we've been all been made to drink into the body of Christ by one Holy Spirit. Uh, listen, my friend, tonight, I'm amazed at the people uh, who say I've got the Holy Spirit and they think they got something uh, better than you. Uh, uh, the Spirit of God is able to operate any gift, uh, but the Spirit of God is what convicted you. It's the Spirit of God that converted you uh, and it's the Spirit of God that indwells you to do whatever God needs you to do. But He won't let you do it outside of the Word of God. I'm amazed at people who tell me I know what I felt. And I don't care what the Scripture says. When they tell me that, I tell them I don't care what you felt. The Holy Ghost does not go contrary to the Word of God. And the Word of God does not work in contradiction to the Holy Spirit. That would be a body confused. And Paul talked about the body. If the whole body was an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the hand says, I don't have any need of the feet, then is the hand not of the body? And Paul was trying to teach his generation because they were trying to confuse the spiritual gifts likewise. And Paul wanted them to understand that when God put together the human body, he tempered every part of that body. And each item that's in that body works in conjunction and unity so that there's not confusion in us. And God is not in all of the confusion that you see in some places that call themselves church. But where the word of God is supremely used and upheld, and Jesus is the head of that church and the Holy Spirit is at liberty to work according to the word of God, that is the true church of the living God. So in chapter 11, he spoke about this mystery in verse 25. Now turn over to chapter 16 of Romans and look at verse 25 and verse 26. Notice that Paul said that to him that is of the power to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, there it is again, the church, which was to be kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. <laughs> Then if you just look over to chapter 2, 1 Corinthians, verse 7, Paul said, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. You see, this mystery that he's talking about is Christ in verse number 7. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So God had this plan before the foundations of the world. He had already set it up how that it was going to operate. And so Paul now is enlightening us how this revelation came to him and how that he had written about it. One of the great tenets of the mysterious truth was that we Gentiles, look at verse 6 of chapter 3 of Ephesians, that we Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That's a blessing to have that understanding tonight that I don't have a covenant with God or didn't. I was an alien. I was without him at one time. But through Jesus Christ who died for me on the cross and was resurrected, he took the middle wall to partition out that said I as a Gentile couldn't come any closer. And now I can come close to God. For I'm built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And Christ is the cornerstone. Amen. And this building fitly framed and joined together grows to a holy habitation. Amen. Habitation of what? A habitation of the Spirit of God Amen. that lives in Amen. us. Amen. Can you imagine that tonight? An old clay vessel like we have that lived in the dirty, rotten, filthy sin that I lived in. Yeah. Uh, and, and as a boy at 18, I'd already done enough stuff that I realized how dirty it was. Uh, but the biggest problem I had was I didn't understand that I was an inherent sinner by Adam because by one man sin entered this world and death came by sin. Uh, and sin was just exercising itself freely in my life. Uh, but on that night, Jesus came to me uh, and was offering to me free grace and free salvation uh, and to wash me in the blood uh, and to make me a part of his eternal body uh, and to guarantee me uh, that I could have eternal life. Uh, and I I was made free that night. And praise God, I've been free ever since. Amen. 
I think I told the mic, the fellow was going to try to make a thing do it. I told that boy, strapped it on a while ago, I said, here's this big guy, and ought to ever have any trouble. <laughs> so now I want you to look at chapter 3 again. And Paul is showing us, or enlightening us, that the mystery that was revealed to him is this church of which you and I are part. Look at verse number 7. The working of this mystery is that it was done by the gift of the grace of God. You understand tonight that by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Amen. Now, you could say to me, well, preacher, I know all that. I thought you was going to come preach something new. Well, there's no new thing under the heavens. Amen. But I want to tell you what I've learned about this story. It never grows old to me. Amen. And I'm thankful tonight that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the work in the mystery was by the gift of grace. The wonder of this mystery, Paul says in verse number 8, is that he felt the least of all, the less than least of all of the saints of God. That God would give him this grace. I mean, go back to his conversion experience. And he was religious, and there's a lot of folks religious today. But they don't know Christ and they don't have a relationship. But there was an experience that happened in Paul's life on the road to Damascus and happened more fully in the house of justice. And when the scales fell from his eyes, he stood up and went to the house of God and was able to testify that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And he couldn't say that before because uh, he was persecuting all of them who declared Jesus to be the Son of God. Uh, and, and, and people uh, was amazed now to hear Paul say that. Uh, and what had happened? He had another revelation out there on the road. Uh, Jesus stepped out of the heavens. His glory was above the brightness of the sun. And Paul heard him call, uh, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, it is hard for you to continue to kick against the pricks. Uh, and Paul cried out and said, Who art thou, Lord? Hey, I got some news for you tonight. Uh, you may not know God, but if he speaks into your heart, you will know it. Amen. You don't have to have somebody tell you. You'll know who he is. And so God gave him grace to save him. And then God gave him grace to raise him up a chosen vessel that he would become the apostle to us Gentiles. You realize tonight that Paul, that little Jewish boy, man, if he hadn't been obedient to the faith of, God, of Christ and the calling of God, we wouldn't be having this jubilee tonight, perhaps. So the working of the mystery was the gift of grace, and the wonder of the mystery is that Paul felt less than least of all saints was this grace given. But look at verse number 8, the latter part of that verse. This mystery and this church has unsearchable riches Amen. the wealth of it Amen. can i tell you tonight that you and i probably have never touched even the surface Amen. of the riches of the good grace Amen. of god our glory Amen. so that's the enlightenment that paul gives now there's a second thing i want you to see tonight and that is the ennoblement of the church and that's in verses 10 through verse 13. the enlightenment's the first nine verses the ennoblement is the next four verses. And if you look at those verses, here's what I want you to take from it. The word ennoblement has a prefix en at the front. And this little prefix by definition means put into. You did not choose me, saith the Lord, but I chose you. I'm your friends. I've heard people and I've witnessed people that says that I'm not ready to choose the Lord. And I tell them that you're not choosing the Lord, but rather He is choosing you. And when He chooses us, that's the opportunity that we have the moment that we can open our heart unto Him and be brought into the family of God. To be put into or to put on, such as in throne or in robe. When I put on this coat, I enrobe myself by putting it on. And the Bible tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ that we don't fulfill the lusts of our flesh. If the E-N were a suffix, it would be used to, uh, in, in words like weaken or hearken that would mean to become or to cause to be. I've not been put in that state, 
But I have been by the power of the Spirit of the living God birthed into this body called the church. And I'm not ashamed of this tonight. Some people act like they're ashamed of their church or they're ashamed of uh, what they believe in their church. I recognize that there are a multiplicity of denominations and enterprises throughout the world. But the most important testimony you can give is that you're blood-bought, blood-washed, born of the Spirit of God, a Bible believer, and one and one only, the Lord Jesus Christ. No greater testimony does a person have than that. Then I want you to look at the word noble in, in, in ennoblement. The word noble means of a high or renowned rank or title. It carries the meaning of being grand and stately and magnificent. What do you think of your church? Do you look at the church of Christ today as being a grand body? Do you look at it as being a stately body? Do you see it as a magnificent body? From the throne room in heaven, when Jesus looks upon his church, that's how he sees it. He sees it grand and stately. He sees it magnificent because he's the one who died for it. He's the one who knew no sin that became sin for us, that we who had no righteousness could become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. He stepped out on the other side and said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of hell. And he showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. Uh, and you can say, preacher, you wasn't there. You didn't see it. I don't have to be there. And I didn't have to see it. I believe that book. That book told me that he arose from the dead. That book told me that he showed himself alive. And that book says that he was last seen ascending. Uh, and two men in white apparel said, why stand you gazing? This same Jesus you've seen taken up is coming again. In like manners, you've seen him go away. Uh, and I'm looking for him. Uh, not only am I looking for him, but I'm listening for him. Because I believe that when he comes, he's coming after the church. You see, we've been called to fellow citizenship and fellow heirship. And I want you to notice something that God does with the church in chapter 3, verse 11. In verse 11, Paul said, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ, excuse me, back up to verse 10, the intent now, he says, for the principalities and the powers. This is the angels. Now, follow me here for just a moment. This is why the church is grand and stately and magnificent. There's things the angels did not know about the church. But God is teaching them through his manifold wisdom. They watch us. In fact, the scripture says they are the ministers to those that are heirs of salvation. The apostle Peter wrote that the angels desired to look into the things when, the, when Peter was writing about the prophets of yesteryear, preached about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The Bible said they searched the manner of the spirit of Christ that was in them that did prophesy. They wanted to know more about it. And not only was those prophets curious, but the Bible said even the angels desired to look into those things. Yeah. Yeah. So when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, guess who was looking in on those things? The angels of God looked into the manger. Uh, and they got so happy in heaven, they started singing and shouting, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Uh, oh, they wonder, wake up the hills of Bethlehem. Uh, you know what needs to happen in a camp meeting like this? We need to wake up the, the hills all around the state of Missouri and throughout the United States. Not only did the angels look in on it there, but they watched Jesus go out in the garden. And they watched him in agony, again his suffering, as he sweat great drops of blood. And the Bible says they ministered unto him. The angels were there when he was before Pilate. And actually was there in the garden when Peter drew out his sword and Jesus said, put up your sword, Peter. I could have called more than 12 legions of angels. They were watching. They were learning. But they weren't learning what they've been learning since the church has been established. Because the intent of God was for these powers and principalities, if you look at verse 10, is that by the church, 
the manifold wisdom of God is being learned. Even the angels, you and I are learning. And the angels are learning. And they're going to be curious when he sends uh, the angels throughout all the four corners of the earth and Jesus ascends the heavens and we begin to take flight to glory. Uh, they're going to even be curious when we gather around the throne uh, and they're going to listen to us sing something they can't sing. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from every kindred, every nation, every people, and every tongue. My heart has been overwhelmed in some of the opportunities we've had in Africa. Two years ago, I was there, preached one Sunday morning, and I preached on the death and resurrection of Christ. And there was an older lady sitting in the back. I didn't know how old she was until at the end of the service. But she dialed in and listened as I talked about the seven cries that Christ cried from the cross and the eighth cry when he came from the grave. And she cried the whole time. And through the course of that message, I kept explaining he was doing this for you and me that he might save us, redeem us, accept us, and forgive us. And when the service invitation began, she started making her way forward, and she motioned for me to meet her, and I met her over on that side of the, the building. And with trembling hands, she reached out and got mine, and she said, I'm 84 years old. That's the first time I ever heard a message about Jesus dying on the cross for my sins. And I didn't know that he was had died, didn't know that he was risen. But you say he's alive. And I showed her in Revelation 3.18 where he is. And she said, well, he saved me. And then I showed her that the Bible said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. And I didn't even get it out. She said, oh Lord, I call you. I want you. I don't know if I'll know you when I get you, but I want you now. And then a little bit she went, who, 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 glory. And I said, what are you feeling? She said, I don't know if I understand it, but she said, I don't feel dirty no more. Right? And I don't feel unclean no more. Right? She said, it feels like something is poured all over me, and I'm whole and I'm clean. And she said, if I weren't so old, I'd take a run. And I reached over in a box and got her a little Bible. I said, this is a Bible. This is God's inspired, infallible word. That means it's divinely given from Him. And it means it's not got an error one in it. And I want you to read it and follow it. And I'll meet you in heaven. When she reached out and took that little Bible, my wife was there and saw this. She, her little hands trembled as she took that Bible. And she brought it up to her lips and she kissed it ever so long. <laughs> And when she did, my heart leaped with joy because I've kissed my Bible hundreds of times since the night I got saved. I know it's just a book with some pages and letters on it, written letters. But to me, until I see him in person, that's how I kiss my Savior. Night after night before I retire for the evening. I may not get to kiss his face someday, but I will be glad to kiss his feet. Amen. Will you? So the church is an ennobled body. And we need to be glad for it. And the manifold wisdom of God is our triumph tonight, which the angels are learning from. And I want to go back just for a moment and, and read you something out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that Paul wrote. Because not only do we have triumph, but we have tribulation. Jesus said that in the world you shall have tribulation. Tribulation is not to make us faint, but it's for our glory. And you remember Paul's thorn in the flesh? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. You can read that. Paul said that because of the revelations that was given to him, lest he should get exalted above measure, God allowed a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, to keep Paul humble. Do you know tonight, the more we humble ourselves, the more of God's grace He gives to us? And if... if God knows that if He showed us something or revealed something to us that we would get exalted, that even though He doesn't like to do it, He may allow a messenger to afflict us, to keep us where we need to be. But Paul said, I've sought the Lord three times that He would remove this thorn. And God said, Paul, my grace 
is sufficient for thee. In your weakness, my power is made strong. Then Paul wrote in verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The last thing I want to give you real quickly is that Paul not only write about the enlightenment that he gives us in this chapter and the ennoblement that the church has from God, but look at the enablement in verses 14 through 21. And I'll just touch on these and then I'll be done. The secret of our enablement tonight in verse number 12 and 14 is our access to the Father. Every one of us have access to the Father. And in verse 15, every one of us have accept, acceptance by the Father. I've been given access to the throne of God. I've been accepted by the Father who lives in eternal glory. That's the secret of my enablement. Here's the source of my enablement, verse 16. It's the invincible Spirit of God. Paul writes about it in verse 16. And listen to what he says as he writes. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might. How? By his spirit in the inner man. Now I still get pretty wound tight as an older man. But I don't preach as hard as I did when I was younger. Because you don't have to look at the outward man very long to see that he's grown older. The outward man's growing weaker. Hair that once was black is now snow white. Eyes that I used to good see without these, I can't see now without them. I've got to have some more windows to help. And I used to have all my teeth, and now I'm starting to lose some of my teeth. So the, the, the Ecclesiastes writer calls them your grinders. And things that used to I used to see bother my dad as he got older, I used to think, why does he worry about that? And now, as I've gotten older, I hear noises in the house. And I'll say, Brenda, what was that? And she'll say, go to sleep, Pharaoh. Pharaoh was my dad. It's just part of getting older. But here's what I want. I said that to tell you this. Though my outward man is perishing, my inner man <laughs> is being renewed day by day. And the source is the invincible Spirit of God. And then the indwelling Son of God in verse 17 lives there. And then the ineffable salvation of God is seen in verse 17 through 19 in that God loved me and Christ died for me. Listen to me, God's love must be experienced. Paul kind of writes like a biologist when he talks about the terms rooted and grounded. The bulb of a plant and the building grows in different ways. They have to be put in the ground, the bulb puts it in the ground, the roots need to go deep to draw from the nutrients and the sources that God placed in the ground so that it can become the beautiful plant that he intended. When a building is being built, they've got to go into the ground and prepare the ground and fix the foundation right. If they go deep enough, the deeper they go, the higher they can go. A large tree puts its roots down deep. The point is that Paul is teaching you and I here tonight is we need to go deeper and deeper and deeper in the love of God so that we can go stronger and stronger and stronger the higher we go. And we need to experience the love. We must be rooted in it. Because it is the soil and source that provides the nutrients. God's love must be examined. Did you notice that he said in verse 18, there's four dimensions, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. How long is love? When did God start loving us? How wide is God's love? How deep is God's love? How high is God's love? It took Jesus from glory to the grave. And he brought him out of the grave as he arose and he ascended back to glory. And one of these days he's coming back to this earth to call his church the mystery that's been revealed to be with him forever and forever. God's love must be experienced, it must be examined, but it must be exhibited. And Calvary love surpasses all of creature love. I read a story about a missionary who was walking in the charred jungles or they call it the bush in Africa charred 
uh, woods of Africa. And he noticed that there was a little hen that had been burnt, charred, and she was all hunkered up by the base of a tree that was hollowed out. And he walked over there, the missionary did, with his toe, and he moved the carcass of that hen. And to his surprise, little chicks ran out from under. She sacrificed her life to save her babies. That's what God did for you and me. Do you see it in John 3, 16, the passion of God? He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but would have everlasting life. There was a young man named Henry Morehouse that was in Great Britain one day. And he had been down and heard Moody preach and he hung around and wanted to talk to Moody. And he said, Mr. Moody, if I'm ever in Chicago, can I preach in your church? And Moody, in a hurry to need to get away, he said, sure, son. He didn't think the boy would ever be in Chicago. If you're ever in Chicago, come and preach. Well, to Moody's surprise, one day, that boy, Henry Morehouse, showed up. He said, here I am, Mr. Moody. I've come to preach. And Mr. Moody said, all right, I'll get the arrangements made. He met with his board, and he said, I've never heard this guy. I don't even know why I told him I'd let him do it. But I'll straighten out whatever mess he makes. And they started the service that evening. He preached on John 3.16 that night. And Dwight Moody said, I was never so moved in all of my heart. And that young fellow started telling me how deep God's love ran. Before the service was over, several had been saved. And Moody said, Mr. Morehouse, we preach again tomorrow night. And he said, I will. And the next night he took his text from John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he not only talked about the depth of the love, but he talked about the width of it. He preached the four dimensions in four nights. And some of the board got around Mr. Moody and said, what is there to straighten out? He said, nothing. He's unstraightened me out. <laughs> Mr. Morehouse became known as the man who moved the man with the word of God that touched the nations of this world. <laughs> Folks, tonight, I feel like God wanted me to say to you that the mystery that Paul wrote to us about that has now revealed the church, we need to appreciate it. We need to thank God for it. We need to live clean, holy, pure lives that the light of Christ may shine through us to this world so that this lost world will come to the church and be saved. In this hour that we're living tonight, you're fortunate that there's many in this area coming, but in a lot of our cities and places all around the world, they're not coming to the church. And some of that's the problem of the church because they have not lived true to what God intended for this church to be. But let us tonight love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength, and body. I want you to look at the last verse. And listen to what Paul says in this last verse. And let me just give you this and then I'll close in prayer. The life of every person is to personally glorify God. When Paul says in verse 21, unto him, that's the personal thing that God wants from me. God wants me to glorify God in my life. When Paul says unto him and in the church in verse 21... My life is to glorify God in the church. And then when Paul says throughout all ages, world without end, God wants my life to glorify God perpetually. You're not just the church when you're assembled here. You're the church and the living God wherever you go. Therefore, we need to forever be praising Him and rejoicing in Him. When I was leaving to go to Africa my first time, I sat down on the plane and I looked out the window and I didn't know I, my wife was crying when I left her in the airport. She said, what if you never come home? I said, Brenda, if that plane goes down in the sea, I'd rather die on my way to the field of, of that dear people telling them about Jesus than to live here and think I'm safe and never make it. When that plane started to take off, as clear as I ever heard God whisper in my ear, I have given you a family in America that will meet you in heaven. But I'm taking you to a land that's older than yours. And I'm going to give you a people there 
that will also meet you in heaven. And while I preached over there that five or six days, there were 64 converts, all of which were 60 plus years of age. And I rejoiced that they'll be the family that meets me in heaven. I couldn't help myself, got a little happy as that plane lifted and he said, Dad, I said, Woo! And a guy sitting across from her is reading the paper and he liked to eat the paper. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, Are you okay? And I said, I'm better than okay. I'm a child of the king. And he pulled that paper back up and he didn't want no more to talk about it. <laughs> Thank you for letting me share with you tonight how important the church of the living God is. 